Welcome to the Beauty Inspires Beauty Podcast, where I've made it my mission to help beauty professionals, creative and independent entrepreneurs like you find the tools, inspiration, and motivation to unlock the abundant life you know you are meant to be living. Each week, you can expect epic guests and solo episodes sharing every tool, trick, and skill set I've learned on my own 20-year journey to grow and scale your life and business. I'm your host, Jessica Bergio, former salon owner turned beauty business mentor and crazy multi-passionate entrepreneur, here to share incredible stories and insight about how others got started and the unconventional path they took to get there. My goal is to inspire you to reach your business and life goals with confidence to achieve your dream life through creating non-negotiables and boundaries without sacrificing your personal well-being and relationships. I know firsthand how real burnout can be. So if you're ready to stop the overwhelm and get clear and focused, you're in the right place, babe. Let's jump right in. What is up and welcome back to the Beauty Inspires Beauty Podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Bergio. Today, I'm super excited. I have a guest who brings up all the feels for me when it comes to this topic around confidence and around mindset uh, when it comes to females in athletic stuff, along with just life itself. Today, we have Shay. Shay's joining us. Welcome, Shay. What's up, Jessica? Excited to be here. Yeah, we've been putting this off for a while. If it's not one thing, it's <laughs> another because life is fucking busy <laughs> and um I'm feeling a little under the weather right now, but this was a conversation I couldn't push off for another day because Shay talks just as much about confidence as I do. And so when I really dug into what it was that she does and who she helps, um, it's funny, it it brought up a lot. Like I was just telling her before we hit record childhood stuff, because I grew up as a child uh, playing tons of sports and, you know, there wasn't a lot of talk around mindset when it came to the game. It was like, get your head in the game. Don't be such a, you know what, like, you fake it till you make it tough it out. Nobody girls don't cry either in sports. So Shay, talk us through, you know, your background a little bit. Um, I know you also host a podcast and are an author of the book called she, the confident. So first, first of all, though, I want to congratulate you. I know you got married not that long ago. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right on. Okay. So talk to us a little bit about like your background and where this kind of came from. Yeah. So it came from, um, obviously I, I grew up playing sports, soccer and basketball at a young age. And I was like a pretty confident kid. Like I was fast. I just had that natural talent as, as you would say. Um, but when I was 12, I tore my ACL. So a pretty catastrophic injury to have at the age of 12 had surgery when I was 13. And at that point, mindset confidence, like that was, was never talked about like ever. And so going through that injury, I really started to doubt myself while I was watching my teammates, like, how am I going to come back from this after, you know, I'm out for nine months while they're training every day, they're getting better. And I'm just sitting here getting worse essentially. And so there was a lot of, you know, mental, emotional, I had anxiety that made my anxiety worse. So a lot of that during the injury, but when I finally came back, my self doubt and lack of confidence was like through the roof. Like I went from being like this super happy, confident, love the sport kind of kid to then like overthinking everything, terrified to make mistakes. I would get this really bad pregame anxiety, like, and that lasted for a long time to where when I was 15, I remember like almost like I hated, I hated the sport at that point because I just had zero confidence, but that's all I knew was the sport. So I had the decision. I was like, I wanted to quit. Like, I remember before practice being like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. And it was all just because of my lack of confidence. And so I decided not to quit because I really wanted to play college soccer. So I decided not to quit. I went and played in a tournament. I ended up getting recruited and the whole pressure of recruiting is like a whole other, whole other deal. Right. Um, But then even in college, like I played for D1 college, but even then my confidence wasn't good. We still didn't talk about it until I think it was like the end of my junior year, we started kind of working with a sports psychologist and he came and talked to the team and stuff like that. And I was like, you know what? Like, I I don't think that what I'm dealing with here is it's not physical. It's, it's like this mental stuff. And I knew it was, but I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know how to change it. Like I didn't know how how to kind of bust through those blocks. So then between junior, senior year, I junior year was awful. Worst, worst year of my career sat the bench. And then senior year, I was like, all right, okay, like I got one year left. I can start trying to apply these mindset strategies and have a good year, or I can just like, you know, continue to pout and sit the bench. So I finally started to like learn these skills and tools and just kind of shift my mindset 
ended up having a great season and everything like best season of, of my career probably. Um, but then when I got out of college, I started coaching. I realized that I wasn't alone. I was never alone in how I felt. Although I, I thought that I was alone, it was something you didn't talk about. And so I realized that so many girls, I would say more girls than not struggle with their confidence, whether it's in their sport or just with their friends or in their school or whatever it is. And so that's kind of what called me to do this is to let girls know they're not alone, which is a big reason why I wrote the book. And then really to just help them work through these things so that when they're in college and in their careers, like they can lead confident lives. And you guys are probably listening to this as, as a beauty professional on, on this end, if you are in my industry thinking interesting person that she's brought on the show, <laughs> but I know for me personally, like the things that plague us and hold us back in our adult life come from somewhere. They come from your childhood. They come from experiences from moments. And that was one of the questions I was going to ask you. I wasn't sure like where that glitch in the system happened, right? Where you got hurt. And then all of a sudden that shifted things. Like that took me back to a few months ago where my son got hit really bad with a baseball while he was playing. Mm -hmm. That kid has every bit of confidence in the world. Now you can't get him to stand up there and not go like this. He can't even swing anymore. Like we've had to take him and have a break from baseball because I didn't, his dad was like, no, he's finishing the season. I'm like, the kid won't even hit. He won't hit anymore. And before he was the overly confident swing at anything kind of kid. And so there's moments where like, I'm thinking God that I've done the work enough and I've been aware enough around people like you, people that are like, it, the push them to cry mentality, isn't going to make my kid better. So the fact that we've let him pull back, like now he wants to go back to baseball. Now he's found that like, where he's not scared and wants to quit anymore. And, you know, when you, when you meet people like Shay, who can talk about mindset and the fact that you're not alone and to build confidence, like I see in coaching, um, even in my industry. And, and even just like when I'm doing stuff with the mastermind, it's just early stage entrepreneurs, people building their business there comes a point where they hit a wall, like there's momentum, there's this, there's that. And then all of a sudden, and the number one thing, it, they, they can't put their finger on it, but it's confidence. It's lacking their, and their abilities of confidence on some level. And mm-hmm. so it's figuring out how to work through that. And again, realizing you're not alone, asking for help, talking about it. Um, yeah. Like besides that one moment when, when you got hurt and you kind of had that, was there, was there other things that kind of threw off your confidence growing up that you can remember or that you see in coaching with these other girls that you work with? Like, where is it one thing that happens to them? Is it like a moment in time? Is everyone like defined by that one thing that happens to them? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I see a couple of things. So sometimes it's just this gradual, like being a teenager, dealing with the, the social dynamics of middle school and high school. Some of it's just the gradual process. But a lot of it is, I hear a lot from uh, bad coaches that like tear them down when they make mistakes. Maybe it's just one coach or one moment or a teacher or sad to say parents. Like I've had to deal with some parents that have really good intentions, but they just, they just aren't self-aware to see the, how they're talking to, or how they're acting is affecting their child in a way that's going to damage them for the rest of their life. And I know like every every adult has some damage from their childhood. Like our, our parents, you know, they love us, but there's always going to be some damage there. So that's like something that, that really affects confidence too, is just like the home life. And sometimes it's this one thing, but sometimes it's just kind of this gradual kind of like tearing down process, especially for girls. It's, it's not hard, honestly, to like get into a slump like that. No, I know. And speaking of like that same experience I had with my, my son's baseball team, there was three different coaches on the team. And while they all meant well, like only one of them was that nurturing type of coach. The other one was one of the dads on the, they were all the dads, but you know, he was actually fairly good with all of the other boys, but except for with his own son, I would, his son would cry. He would make his son cry every game and every practice. And the kid is one of the best ones on the team. And I think not only did it affect his kid, but it also affected the other kids in such a massive way. And so, you know, we're looking to put him in something else. And I talked to this other guy and he says, we make our coaches go through learning how to be coaches. Yeah. That I experienced that growing up too. Like I was a competitive swimmer from seven all the way to high school. And there was a moment in there where my coach got pregnant and I got a new coach and that guy was awful. Mm -hmm. And same thing. I showed up and I quit. And I, and I, I look back thinking, what if, right. We were saying, where could you have been? Had you not had that kind of an experience? Um, 
But I, I think none of it was talked about when we were growing up. And I do think our parents, you know, they do their best they can with us with right, what yeah. they have, but that's, you know, that's usually learned from somewhere. Like you either learn that from a coach, how a coach talked to you growing up. And I've heard, you know, a lot of high school coaches and even college coaches are really hard on the kids. And the mentality of a 16, 17, 18 year old can handle that a little bit better than that of a seven-year-old. So if you've got like a college coach screaming at the seven, eight-year-olds, like they do the big kids, like you can't comprehend that at that age, you know, all you hear is yelling. So it's like those defining moments of that. So how do you take someone who's being challenged at those kids or these parents come to you looking for some help? Like, where do you even start with them? Um, a lot of it is just figuring out like what, like what they're, a lot of it comes down to fear right? A lot of it is fear of mistakes, fear of what other people will think of me. Um, like it just comes down to fear. So it's really fa- for me as a coach, figuring out like, what is, what is behind your lack of confidence? It's always some sort of fear. So getting into like, what is your fear? And then really changing your perception, whether it's perception of failure or perception of how other people think of you. But like kind of going back to what we we're talking about is our society is, and especially in sports is so result oriented. So, so many players, they can, and and just people in general, if they're getting good results, whether it's in their business or their sport, they are confident in the moment, right? But as soon as things don't go your way, that confidence completely goes down. And so it's like, how can we teach people to become confident and, you know, have self-worth despite their results or lack of results? And so that's really, for me, it's like, how can I help a player, what I call like build unshakable confidence so that no matter what good, bad, ugly, not ugly, like they are confident and they love themselves regardless of, you know, what's going on outside of them. So are there some strategies that you teach or that you could kind of share with us that are like ways? I mean, cause let's be honest, we're all a bunch of, uh, drunk <laughs> or trapped being little kids. Oh, totally. Right? We're, all, we're all reparenting ourselves. And there's moments where yeah. that's what you just said is so true to this day, no matter I'm 40 years old now. And there's still moments where, yeah, when yeah. things are good, feel on top of the world, you got momentum, confidence, all the things. And the second something goes left, I'm like, oh shit, I know I should have done that. Like, it's just, you, you can, it's so easy to get flipped into that questioning yourself or overthinking, like you were saying? Well, yeah. I mean, the first step for anyone, it's really just self-awareness, right? Self-awareness of first kind of like your thoughts, like what, what am I thinking? What, what am I telling myself? Cause a lot of times, like we're not very nice to ourselves, right? Like we, we think 70,000 thoughts per day, I guarantee you for most people, most of those are not very nice thoughts, right? So if you aren't aware of your thoughts, you're never going to change your thoughts and you're going to believe your thoughts. So there, there's part of me that thinks the thoughts come before beliefs and part of me that thinks the belief come before thoughts. It just, I think it just depends on where you're at, but the first thing and thoughts are a lot more easier to dive into than beliefs, but really being aware of your thoughts. And then once you're aware of your thoughts, I think we need to learn to separate that we are not our thoughts, because if we think we're our thoughts, then it's like, oh, I have negative thoughts. Therefore, like I am that thought, but it's no, your thoughts are separate from you. You're just the person observing your thoughts. So that's really important, just perspective to have that your thoughts are not you. And then once you realize that is actually like looking at them and questioning your thoughts, like saying, is this, is this really true? Like, is there actually any, you know, factual, you know, truth behind these thoughts or are these just made up stories and made up beliefs that I've been telling myself? Right. And the reason why it's important for us to really look at our thoughts and or beliefs and see if they're actually true is because if we believe our thoughts to be true, they'll become these these beliefs and these patterns that we carry with us for forever. Right. Until we break them. But if we can prove to ourselves that our thoughts are not actually true, then we can just let go of them. So it's not like we're trying to push them away. It's that we're accepting them saying, you know what, you're not you're not true and just let go of them and they can just kind of move through you. So it's not that we're pushing them away. It's not like they're ever going to completely go away. It's being aware of them, accepting them, saying that they're not true and letting go of them. And then obviously, you know, turning that into more of a positive, empowering thought. Yeah. And that, I, I get that a lot from Lori. Lori used to talk about that all the time, like the kind of almost imposter syndrome, but kind of based around like that fear that comes up and it's like, she referred to it like when she's about to step on stage or when she's going to speak or something and the little fear person's like, you're not equipped. You're not qualified. You're not like all of these like thoughts start coming into your mind. Right. So I would, you know, at times say that the thoughts come before the belief because 
you know, she wouldn't be about to step on the stage if she didn't believe she could do it at one point. And the thoughts come in and kind of try to scare you out of it. And the fear, like the way I talk to my son about fear, especially is when you feel fear, that means you care. That's what I tell myself. So if like when, before I used to get on stage to compete, like of course, I'm scared, yeah, I'm scared. I'm going to fall in a trip. Like the fear, the fear comes in so many different ways. Not the fear that I, I'm already here, like we're doing it. But it was like all of the little voices, like you're, you know, are talking to you. And I was like, I own, I'm only scared because I care so much that I like really yes. want to do well. And so being yeah. able to flip that. And um, it's interesting going through being a parent now and watching my son go through those pockets of fear and like kind of reliving stuff with him. It's so interesting because he's almost 10. So, and he's played a couple different sports, but the poor kid the other night, he races BMX too. Like I would never, and he's up on the gate and they got to like hold themselves up on the gate and right out of the gate, he falls eat shit so bad. And I was just like, he got right back up and did it again. And it's like, yeah. man, it's just watching the resiliency of, you know, when you want something bad enough, um, being able to push through that. But I do, I not going to lie. I do give myself a little credit when I see him cry and then get back up. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah. I him all the time about being confident and about the fact that if you're scared, it's because you care and like just rewording that. So you're talking to yourself in a more positive way. It's not about always like saying some affirmations in your head. You know, you mm-hmm. guys know how I keep it real. Like I do think positive self-talk is a huge thing. And the way that we talk to ourselves obviously is important. Um, but I'm always so curious, like we're all the same when it comes to that negative self-talk, even people yeah. who are highly successful, I'm sure still have yeah. pockets of that, like imposter syndrome, Absolutely, crazy shit to themselves. Yeah. And you know what too uh, interesting about fear is that, um, I think that a lot of times when we're nervous or have fear, have anxiety, the reason why it gets so bad is because we're in resistance to that fear, right? Right. We feel fear and we're like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be feeling fear. And so then we get more fearful. Yeah. And so like, I have parents come up to me and say like, how can I help my daughter? What can I say to my daughter to help her not be nervous before a game? And I'm like, just, just tell her it's okay to be nervous. Right. Because when we're like, oh my gosh, why am I feeling this? I shouldn't be feeling this. It just like continues to build. And so realizing that like, you know, it's okay. Like you said, the fear is just like letting like your body know that you care and that you're ready. And it's just a way that you're, you know, getting your nervous system, like, like built up and ready for this thing. Like once we can learn to like, be okay with fear, then it'll just like the negative thoughts, it'll just move through you. Yeah. But as soon as you're like worrying about it, it's just going to stay there. So you've got these kids who you're teaching to become self-aware around where that confidence is lacking, where the fear is popping up. Like in Mm -hmm. what ways do you specifically help them build that back up? Like, where do you take a kid who is feeling like you did on the bench and had that accident? You were like all of the things, like, where do you start with them to try to like, what, what ways do you have them do things? Is that home? Are there tools that as adults listening right now can like kind of take (laughs) we're in that moment of maybe they had a setback or something happened with their career or their business or even relational. That's like holding them back from work. Like, because something at home's not going well. Right. Yeah. So like, obviously first it's kind of being aware of what's going on inside, but then it's like, okay, now we need to actually just go take action and do it. Like whether it's a fear of failure, which for most people, no matter if it's sports or business or whatever, it's some sort of fear of failure. So if we are aware of our thoughts, but then we still don't take action, like those thoughts are going to consume you and you're just going to prove to yourself that, yeah, I can't do it. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's almost like going out and proving your thoughts wrong and like getting outside of those, that comfort zone and just like going out and trying And if you fail and you make a mistake, that's great. Like, at least you did it. You can be proud of yourself. So it's kind of like this, this cycle of like, of like being aware and and changing your mindset, but then like going out and taking action on that new thing, getting outside of your comfort zone and realizing that when you take action and you get outside of your comfort zone, you're either going to get the outcome you wanted and you can be happy and excited and that'll improve your confidence. Or you can learn something from that, which then when you learn something from it, you can get better. When you get better, you grow your confidence. So it's just like either way, there's it's a win-win situation when you get outside of your comfort zone and when you take chances. And once someone is willing to like break through that and actually try, like that's where a lot of the results start happening because they can have a great mindset and they can have great thoughts, but if they don't actually take action on it, then it's like, it's not really like going to lead to like real results. Well, there's no proof there. And I feel like yeah. we've, we've all learned too. like, once you get a little proof under your belt, you're like, yeah. oh, I can do that. So it's like that one small sure. step. And then, then, then you're willing to take the next harder step, which is, you know, a tiny bit further out of the comfort. Yeah. Room. 
And, you know, I think for a lot of people, like they're, I don't know if they're sick of hearing about like, get out of your comfort zone, but I'm like, only, you know, what that is like your comfort zone isn't mine and vice versa. So like what someone else is, what thinks is scary, you might not even blink at. And so that's where like the self-awareness comes in, like she's talking about and just kind of reassessing, like if there's things in your life that are, you're hitting that wall of resistance or you're hitting that wall of like fear that's holding you back. Like that's when it's time to step back. It's like, where did that come from? And what kind of conversations can you start having with Mm -hmm. yourself or where can you find help? Like that's where coaches, mentors, you know, friends that have gone through things too before. It's like, that's one of the number one things people have a hard time doing is asking for help. And I talk about it all the time, but for me, I realized early on, it wasn't that I had a hard time asking for help. I just didn't always know what I needed help with. So mm-hmm. be able to like start the conversations, like I'm, ch- I'm challenged here. I keep feeling resistance here and letting someone who's like an expert, like you kind of dig in and ask better questions. Cause then that's when the good shit pops up. And that's what happened yeah. coaching for me too, with the six figure stylist. It's really a, a six figure mindset course around why can't you bust through and get where you want to be. And then when we dig into it, you, you start to figure out the little, like, okay, you keep saying this, or you keep acting like this is, you know, yes. and when you can get people to like explain their beliefs that they're having or their conversations that they're having, that's when you can really get the help. Oh yeah. Cause it's so hard to like, know what your patterns are and what your own beliefs are just when you're, when you're in it, cause you're, you're in it. Right. Like, but if you have someone to talk to, it's like, it's, it's so obvious for me when I'm talking to someone and you just ask, have to ask the right questions, right. In order to get someone to like, Oh, now I see what the, what the real issue is. But when it's you, it's like, it's really hard. So accountability is a huge thing here. And number one, figuring out like, what are the real root issues? But number two, like getting you to get outside of your comfort zones. Cause for me, like if I don't have a coach, I'm probably going to be inside my comfort zone way too long. Right. Or like, you know, I, I work with Chris, um, and you know, fast foundations, he's my one-on-one coach. And it's like, I feel like every time it's like doing something that, you know, pushes me outside of my comfort zone a little bit. And that's what I challenge my girls to do. Like, you know, when we're on our calls, I say, okay, like we'll even draw what our comfort zones look like. What's on the inside, what's on the outside. Okay, great. Now go circle one thing that's on the outside and just do it. And it doesn't have to be anything crazy. It can be ordering, ordering your own drink at Starbucks. It can be talking to a new friend, like can be trying a new move at practice. Like it's not these earth shattering things, but it's just getting, like you said, getting the proof and like getting these little wins under your belt. And the more you do that, it's just kind of like a a snowball effect in your confidence gets bigger and bigger. And you can start to see like these patterns unfolding and all that kind of stuff. I love that. I I interviewed a guy one time on the podcast, like early on, and he like kind of blew my mind because we were talking about comfort zones and doing things. He was a musician and someone told him he should go be a hairdresser. So he went to school, (laughs) but he was talking about the fact that he's like, I try to, I try to always expand my comfort zone versus putting myself outside of my comfort zone. So he just pulled himself a different perspective on how to look at it versus (laughs) I'm going to do one thing out there. He was like, Nope, we're just going to keep growing it. And I was like, I like that theory too. So like whatever works for you, I feel like it's not a one size fits all when it comes to comfort zones. It's just about doing that little thing that scares you. And that's why I love doing these little challenges that I do. Cause it gets people to do things that they're out of their patterns. And when we yes. see in those patterns, it's like, we keep getting the same results. Yes. Um, how have you seen confidence or lack of confidence, like hold these kids back or even hold adults back? in, in mm. doing. Yeah. I mean, kids, it's like, they, one of the biggest things is honestly, they just don't have fun. Mm. Like, like they, they aren't playing full out. They're kind of like holding back. And when you play like that in any sport or, or anything you're doing, if you're not giving it your all, you're not having as much fun. So that's like one of the biggest things is that they don't have fun. And then really is also, just as the social stuff goes is huge for the girls that I work with. Like a lot of them have gotten bullied in the past. A lot of them have, you know, bad relationships with their teams and their, um, their teammates and their friends and stuff like that. So like the more, and also confidence, like if you aren't confident, especially as a teenager, you're going to attract people that, uh, aren't probably the best people in the world because you're trying to be somebody that you're not. Right. And if you're trying to be somebody you're not, you're going to attract the wrong people into your life. And as a teenager, if you have the wrong people in your life, that can totally change the whole trajectory of your life. So it's so important that I tell my girls, like, I, I don't like, if nobody likes you, like, that's okay. As long as like you are being yourself, like who cares if someone, 
you know, doesn't like you. Like there's a 7 billion people in the world. Not everybody's going to like you. And so just be you and just be yourself and be confident in who you are, because when you are the right people will come into your life. And I, that can be said for, for adults too. Right. And then as far as adults go, how confidence holds them back is like, it just, it keeps us safe. Like when we're not confident, we just, we just do what's safe. We do what we're supposed to do. We just like, you know, we, we live in what's, what society tells us to do and get married, have kids, get a job, uh, retirement. Like, it's just like this, this, we're all living in this world where it's like, we don't actually do what we really want to do. So when you have confidence, it's like, like there's, there's, it kind of like removes that, that glass ceiling of what's possible. So for adults, like my end goal with the kids is to help them become confident adults so that they can create the life they want to live and, and honestly just change the world. Right. So that's kind of like my long term. but yeah, for adults, I've, I've seen with friends, with family, like so many people who aren't confident and they just, they stay in their small story. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. And so if anybody listening has kids or, or children that like girls, especially that play any sports and you're looking for support, yeah. like definitely reach out to Shay. She has an awesome book um, that you can read along with your daughter. Um, or if you are a coach even too, or if you know anybody who is yeah. like, we all have friends who are parents of, you know, girl athletes. And this is, I think a huge, huge topic because, you know, as we are adults and we've been in this mastermind now, and you just see the mm-hmm. levels of which confidence or lack of has held so many of these people back from having successful lives and businesses. And it's one of the things mm-hmm. that, like, I thought I got hired to be this like strategy accountability coach for, <laughs> yeah. and really I'm there like holding people's not hands, but like you can do it. It's more of like a cheerleader, which is, I, yeah. I was such a tomboy, like who knew I'd ever end up as a as a cheerleader, but I could tumble and they're like, stop the cheering, but why don't you go back there? But so it's like, I, I am so thankful that you've created what you have. And I, you know, I wish I could go back as a kid and have somebody, you know, speak that into me mm-hmm. because I think with that confidence built, I mean, we all have the potential that's untapped. Like you said, where's the glass ceiling if you don't put one. Um, yeah. So what is this, what is this alpha girl collective that you have too? Yeah, I love the alpha. So it's a, it's a group coaching program. It's um, really just about community and about like, I just, so in the past, all my coaching programs, it was just for the girls. We just had our, our coaching calls and the parents were kind of removed from it. But like, after doing this for so long, I realized that the parents are such a huge part of it. So yes, we have like our, our group coaching calls every week with, with the girls that there's a course and like everything they need to be confident. There's a community that goes along with it. But then also once a month, we have like parent calls where like the parents of those girls will come on and we'll just talk about like, what is your daughter struggling, struggling with? How can I support you as a parent and helping to support her? Like, it's just really, really cool to have the parents really in it because if I'm teaching them everything and, and we're talking about all the right things, but then they go home and the parents on, we're on different pages and stuff like that. Like, it's really not going to work, you know, like, or if it does work, it's going to be really, really difficult so the collective is really just about, that's why I call it the collective about building the, the collective confidence of, of girls around the world. And so that's, that's one of my newer programs. Um, that's kind of my, my, like my big thing right now. Um, so yeah, I love it. And then, um, we're also doing, um, like a sticker membership where girls get these, uh, really cool stickers, um, that they can put on their water bottles, their softball bats, like stuff like that to kind of give them like little, little words of affirmation and motivation and stuff like that, which is going to be cool. I love that. I mean, the more girl power you get started, the younger yeah. you started, the better. Um, you recently did a podcast with that Natalie Norris on, um, using nutrition yeah. as your secret weapon. I wanted to talk about nutrition as it plays a whole, because as I'm currently sick, it's like, everyone's offered me all the Tylenol and the drugs Yes, and like, this is what you should eat. These are the vitamins you should take. I mean, I know that cause I come from a nutrition background. So, um, mm-hmm. Talk to us about like where like nutrition and whatnot can play such a huge role for like these kids and for adults. Yeah. I mean, think about it. If you're physically, if you physically don't feel well, you're not going to feel very good mentally and, and vice versa. Right. But, but like, 
a lot of kids, they'll, they'll be eating like crap and people in general, they'll be eating like crap. And they, they, they obviously feel like crap when they eat like crap. And then they think, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with me. Well, there is, it's because you're not eating well, but then it totally affects your confidence, your mindset, your mental health and everything like that. And for me that I've struggled with anxiety for a lot of my life, I've really had to learn that certain things cause me to feel more anxious than other things. And so I have to be really aware of, you know, what I put into my body and how that affects me physically and my performance, but also mentally and my emotional and, and like my mental health. So nutrition is huge. And when I was playing, we, we, we didn't talk about it. We just, you know, went to Arby's and McDonald's after games. And it was just like, it doesn't, it didn't really matter because it was all about how you look right? But it's so much more than how you look. It's like how you feel. And I think that there's starting to be more conversation around that for like, you know, athletes in general, and uh, obviously just, just people in general, but yeah, you, nutrition plays a huge role in obviously how, how you feel about yourself. Yeah. It's crazy because, um, I have, you know, in the family has a history of like anxiety and some depression mm-hmm. and whatnot. Yeah. And as my mom and my grandma started me so early on vitamins and just knowing what was healthy and what's not, I'm very aware if I eat something, how I feel, but when it came to finally getting into competitive bodybuilding, that's when you ate for a specific training session. So it got so granular, like, okay, tomorrow morning's leg day. So tonight, this is what you're eating for tomorrow's training. And it was like, if I didn't pay attention to eating properly for certain things, like it just, I didn't feel the same. I didn't have the same amount of energy. And so, you know, there's so many things that you can help with that help with your, your mood, which if you're in a shitty mood, you're not going to feel confident. If you're in a funk and your body feels out of whack, you're not going to feel confident in showing up as your best self, whatever the case may be. So that's why I'm all a huge proponent for nutrition being like first and foremost. So do you talk a lot about that with the kids too, on what they're eating and what they're putting in their body? So I, every month I have guest speakers that come on and very often I have nutrition experts come on. So I like, I would say I'm, I know enough about nutrition and and everything like that, but I wouldn't consider myself like an expert. So I, I bring on experts. Like I have one coming on next month because it's just so important, um, for everything that we're talking about for being the best all around athlete and person you can be. And also like looking at it in terms of sport, like looking at there's the technical piece of sport, there's the tactical piece, there's the physical piece. And then there's which physical we could put nutrition in there. And then there's like the mental piece, right? And out of all of those four, the only kind of pillars that really last a lifetime are the physical piece. So nutrition and the mental piece, because when you're an adult, it doesn't really matter if you can shoot a basketball, not really, unless you're trying to be a pro, right? But like the way you treat your body and treat your mind as a youth athlete or as a kid is going to affect you as an adult. It's going to stay with you forever. So like, those are two big pieces that really go hand in hand. Well, and let's be honest, like I'm trying to keep up with my 10 year old. So if I and yeah. paying attention to, it's not about shooting the hoops, but it's about like, can I keep up with you on a bike ride? So, you know, put what I put in my body is just a direct effect of what goes into his. And I've seen my friends that are naturally, let's just say thin struggle with feeding their children healthy because they can eat whatever they want, but maybe their kids can't, or if their kids are playing sports, they're wondering why they're lethargic or they can't keep up with the rest of the team. Or, you know, when girls hit puberty, they put on weight and it's like, how do I have that conversation when I've never struggled with that? And so, you know, just being mindful, I thought, you know, my mom is such a huge, like, she's still on me to this day about what my son eats and him eating too much sugar and this and that, because he's a boy, he's got, you know, and they want to label every single little boy with ADD. They they don't, right? they can't sit still. I mean, I can't sit still for eight hours in a class. Right. And I tell him all the time, you talk now. I said, your mom found a job that I talk for a living. I stand up and I talk for a living. So does his dad. (laughs) So I'm like, just fine, but it's definitely, I can see, you know, if he's had too much carbs at night, his energy spikes. If he's had too Mm -hmm. much sugar, he's bouncing off the wall. Yes. Hasn't had enough calcium in his system. He twitches at night when he's sleeping, like, especially for little girls, you know, going through that, that stage. And if you have a daughter, like for me, what I noticed was like, when, when they go through puberty and they go through all that, you know, making sure they have enough calcium in their system. So they're feeling good. If, if they're not loaded up with the right vitamins, like you might not grow as tall as you were supposed to. Like I attribute starting smoking cigarettes when I was 13 as well. I stopped at five, five. I got, I got hands of someone who should be like five ten. <laughs> you know, that's why I am a huge proponent with nutrition. And it starts with like how we're talking to ourselves, what we're putting in our yes. body. 
and then the, the support that you get around yourself. So if you have a daughter, if you have somebody who has a young girl who's an athlete who could use support, please reach out to Shay. She's got so many programs and rad things you could be a part of. There's a book you could grab and read at home with her. Um, Shay, I love watching you just grow and blossom into this awesome businesswoman that you have. It's been really cool to watch. So I, I wish you tons of success. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Jessica. It was awesome. And can I make one more point on the nutrition thing? Yes, please. So another big thing with confidence, especially teenage girls is like body image is everything, right? If so for me, when I was, when I went through my injury, I was still eating a ton and I, and I got a little bit chubby and my body image went totally down the toilet. So that played a huge role for, so for, especially teenage girls, not just, you know, how they're going to perform, but body image is a huge thing with confidence. So the better you can put, the more you can put better food into your body, you know, the better the body image is going to be too. So that's huge. I just, I just want to say that, but yeah, thank you so much for, for having me on. It was an awesome conversation. Awesome. And where can people find you? Where are you on Instagram? Yeah. On Instagram at Shay Haddo, uh, Twitter at Shay Haddo. And then you can find like the podcast and the book just on my website, which is alphagirlconfidence.com. Alphagirlconfidence.com. Awesome. We'll have all of that in the show notes for you guys too. And this should come out in a couple of weeks, but it was so great to chat with you, Shay. Um, Good work doing out there with the girls. I'm proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate it. See you on the next one, guys. I'm going.